to see everyone. So today, we're, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to get away from Nehemiah. We went through the first five chapters of Nehemiah. We'll continue. Pick back up with Nehemiah next week, chapter 6, which is a chapter in which the wall is going to be completed, and um, I'm looking forward to that. But this week, just to get away for a moment, it's nice to every once in a while segue away from maybe the, the entirety of a book that you're in, just to change things up just a bit. Um, I try to plan things out one to two months ahead of time, so this was, this was planned out months ago. And today's message, as you saw by the title, if you, if you happen to see it up there on the screen when it was there, The Cost of Discipleship, this is, let me just say this before we get into it. It's a very challenging word that Jesus speaks of, and the reason I chose that passage in John chapter 6 about his body and him being the living bread, unless you eat of my body and drink of my flesh, you have no part in me, so on and so forth. And later on, John 6, 66, which is very easy to remember, says many of his disciples walked with him no more when he said, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood. Well, he meant it spiritually speaking. But nevertheless, the point is to follow Christ and be a disciple or a learner is a very selfless, all-encompassing, entire devotion, full surrender work of God. It's, it's nothing less than that. To follow Jesus Christ according to his words, as you'll see, is nothing less than complete devotion, 100%. To be a disciple, now some will say there's a difference between being a believer and a disciple, perhaps there is. I, that's not my, my point in the message today. My point is, for you, I pray by listening to God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit to maybe give a little bit more understanding into what it means to be a disciple and what that cost of discipleship is. So we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 10, and then the cross-reference will be Luke chapter 14 in one of the, in these two synoptic gospels. Matthew chapter 10, and we'll look at verses 34 through 42. Verses 34 through 36 have to do with devotion and death. 37 through 39 you'll see a couple of different delegates mentioned, 40 and 41, and then 42 speaks of the disciples. So once again, there's a, there's a lot of D's involved in this when you break it down, if you were to break it down that way. And Jesus is giving instructions to the 12 here, and when he gets to this part, I wonder what they must have been thinking, listening to these words. Perhaps they had a different perception of what being a disciple would be too. Perhaps they thought it was going to be a party or something great. The king has arrived. But it's anything but that. In fact, when he's speaking in Luke verse 10, verse 18 to the disciples or the 70 that had returned with joy, they said, he said, Jesus, they, even the, the demons, the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Jesus had a very interesting response in Luke 10, 18. Jesus said, Behold, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Well, why would he say that? I believe he was saying, gentlemen, disciples, ones that I have selected, you are vulnerable. You are missing it. You are in danger of falling just like Satan. Following Jesus Christ is the straight and the narrow path. Being his disciple means a life of devotion and death to self. I've said it in the past. You've heard me say it. It's not your best life now. It is anything but that. Now, God is good and worthy to be praised. He's the good shepherd. He gives us good things freely to enjoy. Don't miss that. But make no mistake about it, this text is one of the most challenging there is in the entirety of Scripture. And it's the red letters of Jesus Christ. 
He says in verse 34, as he continues the dialogue, the instructions to his 12, Matthew 10, verse 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am not come to send peace, but a sword or division, as it says in the Gospel of Luke. For I am come to set a man at variance or to sever against his father. A man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You ready to sign up? And a man's foes or rivals or enemies shall they be of his own household. Welcome. This is not a message that will be seeker-friendly, will not soothe your flesh. This is the reality and the possibilities of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Not only across the pond, not only across the world, there is no American Bible version. You know that. There's no ABV. I know we have lots of Bible versions, but there's no ABV of discipleship. What Jesus is speaking then applies to every single continent you see on that map in the back. Every single one. We don't get the ABV. We don't get the American discipleship version. There's no manual like that. This is the manual. Listen to this. This is a gentleman who was a Muslim. It's a personal testimony. He started to read the Bible every day. He was part of a very devoted Muslim family. He says, within months I read the Bible in its entirety. Then I read it a few more times. The more I read, the more I saw God as my true and loving Father. God's word, God's word spoke to all the difficult situations in my life, to my many fears and anxieties. I knew that whenever I opened the Bible, I would feel God's comfort. One day I went up to my room, locked the door, fell on my face, and prayed to God, telling him I would put my trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. I wanted to share this decision with my family, but I was terrified of the repercussions. I remember calling my favorite aunt. She was like a mother to me and asking, if I was to believe in Christ, what would you think? She responded, you'd be given three chances to return to Islam or be put to death. After that, I decided to keep my faith hidden. I started waking up every Sunday morning to attend church, but my family noticed these strange absences. They also noticed that I had been praying or reading my Quran. When my mother and my siblings found my Bible, they had proof I had become a Christian. One night, around 2 a.m., I received a call from my grandfather, the head of our tribe. As we spoke about my faith, he grew angry, shouting, You are no longer part of the family. Change your name. You are dead to us. I sent him an image of the cross and a passage from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' command to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But this was powerless against his wrath. My uncle called me with a warning. Gather your family, pack your bags, move out of the house, he said, because your grandfather is going to terrorist groups, and if they find you, they will kill every single person in the house. And I'll stop there. This is not a joke. This is not a reality television show. This is discipleship around the world. This is the red letters of Jesus Christ being true today. Understanding this is not a game, it's not a joke. We're in a very serious time in history. It's all in or it's all out. There's no in between. There's no double-mindedness. First commandment, you'll have no other gods before me. And listen as we move forward in the text. Verse 37. Challenge for your devotion. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. It's pretty much your entire immediate family. Your father, 
You came from his seed, your mother, you came out of her womb. Your son or your daughter were procreated together in the image of God. And yet Jesus says, you need to love me more. Your devotion has to be preeminent to me if you want to be my disciple. And that's where a lot of people check out. Have you made this statement before? Family is the most important thing. Family is the most important thing. Well, let me tell you this. Family is extremely important. But that is an antichrist statement. Family is not the most important thing. The most important thing is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The most important thing is your relationship with the living God. That is the most important thing that you have as a Christ follower on earth. Family is very, very important. I've grown in understanding of that the last 20 plus years. Your family is made in the image of God. Your wife, your husband, your children, they are what's closest to you on earth. But Jesus says, all of them must take second place or a back seat to your devotion to me. This is what he's telling his disciples, preparing them to go out into a hostile world against the message of the cross, the gospel, the person of Jesus Christ. He says, he that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Your life, my life is hidden in Christ. Die to self. What's your plan? What's your purpose? You know, we were talking about this, Barry and I, briefly in the back, and he happened to see the movie Jesus Re Revolution. I saw it with one of my sons Friday. And there's no such thing as coincidence. There's no question about it that this film and what's been going on globally, but here in the United States, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to reach people who have not been reached yet. If you see the movie, it's a true story. The generation that was reached in the late 60s, early 70s, was a group of people that were outcasts, dirty, hippies. And it just took one man, one man, just like Nehemiah that we're learning about, to open up his table, as we talked about last week, to open up his heart. And God transformed a country. And the fruit remains today, in 2023, in the form of pastors and preachers and missionaries and husbands and wives and disciples. And perhaps, just perhaps, Barry doesn't even know that he said what he said is so profound, because I've had the same thought. It just may be that right now, our hippies may be the LGBTQ community. How would you respond? How would you react if a transgender came into this sanctuary? How would we respond? If someone who came in who's radically lost because they don't know the love of God, if they just happen to stumble into Spencer Port Bible Church, how would we react? You see, you're going to see another family that Jesus speaks of shortly. He's speaking of the biological family first, but he's going to be speaking of another family very shortly. And the difference between the two families is this. One is your natural. One is your supernatural. One is born of man, the seed of woman. One is born of God. Now, you can be both. If you have family members and they know the living God, they're saved, they're born again, praise God. You have both. But make no mistake about it, this community, which I've been very direct toward in truth, the LGBT community, what they're really missing is purpose. They're missing love. They don't know what love is. They don't know how to find it. They're searching for love in all the wrong places, like that old song goes. They're searching for love. They're searching for a way just like the hippies were with drugs and LSD. They're searching for in perversion and they're listening to the world. And it's our job 
to send out the rest you call of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to give them a haven. It doesn't have to be inside these walls. To reach out in love and in truth, build relationship, build rapport, stand on the truth. It's an opportunity here. And Jesus is preparing his disciples and letting them know exactly what this means. Luke 14, he tells them this, to count the cost. He says, what man of you, if he's going to go out to build a tower, doesn't first consider if he has enough materials to build it? Lest the foundation is built and you stop and you're mocked. That's a picture of someone who claims the name of Christ, but then lives like the devil after a short period of time. Why? Because when the trials of life comes, when the difficulty of life comes, when the persecution comes, they fall away. Why? Because they were never really converted. They never really had deep roots. They were make-believers. They weren't truly saved. They weren't truly sanctified. It says, count the cost. Consider this. Remember in Nehemiah last week? After he was angry about what was going on with his people being ripped off? It says he consulted himself. He thought deeply about the situation. Do we think deeply about really what this means to follow Jesus Christ right now in this age in America in our current state of affairs? Listen to what he says here momentarily. But I want to give you a little bit of an inventory, something to think about. Because I know how difficult that is to actually consider and take very seriously that Christ would have preeminence in your life above even the person that's closest to you. You realize the first commandment, as I mentioned, is have no other gods before me. Perhaps that's the most broken commandment by Christians. Your mother, your father, your spouse, your children often can become your God. Well, here's some questions to think about. Who gets most of your time? Question number one. Who gets most of your time? Question number two. Who gets most of your energy? Question number three. Who gets most of your thoughts, your thought life? Lastly, who gets your heart? If the answer is not Jesus, you have a God before him, and so do I. You see, this is where American Christians say, I'm good, this is too hard, I'll walk with you no more. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, speaking these red letters. We ought to consider it. We ought to consider it, what it means to truly follow. Jesus Christ said, a servant's not above his master. They hated me, they'll hate you. But God's grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Much higher are the heavens and the earth, his thoughts and his ways, than ours. Now here comes the second family. Jesus says, verse 40, He that receives you, a disciple, receives me. And he that receives me, or he that receives me receives him that sent me. There's a trinity there. You, the Father, and the Son. Father, that they may be one as we are one. The priestly high prayer, John 17. When you are a disciple of Christ, you are part of the family of God. There's no higher calling than that. There's no better family than that. And you know what the family of God is on earth? I'm going to tell you a word. It's dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional. Why? Why? Because this family on earth is not in heaven yet with the Father. On earth, dysfunction will remain just like in the book of Nehemiah. Problems will continue. So how do you handle it? By going to your Father, by forgiving, by loving, by forbearing, by embracing. That's how you do it. He says in verse 41... He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's rewards. So we have a prophet and a righteous man so far. 
Who are they? They're part of the family. They're part of the family. And whosoever, verse 42, whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, simply because you're connected to the family of God, just a cup of water, if you were to give to one of the little ones in the back, just a cup of water, listen to this, verily, truly I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. That's amazing. Why? Because you're part of the family of God. You're part of the church of Jesus Christ in whom Jesus is the head. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. There's two families here in this passage. See, Jesus is pro-family. Don't miss the point. He is pro-family. He created family to glorify him. But understand this. His expectation, his call, is for complete allegiance to him. The one who gave you that family. The one who gave you your spouse gave you your child, gave you all of this. He gave it to you. You could be like the young man I just read about, but he gave you all of this. And he says, you must hate them. Your love for me must, your, must pale. Their love, the way you love them, it should, be, it should pale in comparison. It's preeminent. Your, your allegiance, your heart, everyone knows you have a single eye. There's nothing like the love of God. What's another requirement of a disciple? A disciple continues in my word. How do you know a disciple? All men will know you're my disciples by your, well, you know, doctrine. Let me try again. All men will know your disciples by your theology. I mean, you know that, right? Absolutely not. All men will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. That's what will draw the hippie. That's what draws the LGBT community. That's what draws your lost son. That's what draws your lost daughter. That's what draws your lost spouse. The love you have for another. The agapeo, the selfless love. The one that says this guy has a different agenda because he died to himself and I want that. That's the love of God. It's supernatural. That's what it is. The love of God. There's nothing that transcends it. It's the only thing you take into eternity. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Why? God is love. That's why. You take it into eternity. You don't need faith anymore. You don't need hope anymore once you cross over. But love, it's there. It's there. Let me end with this. This has been a very special passage to me as of late. So I'm going to read it to you. Ephesians. This is uh, Paul's apostolic prayer. Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 14. Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 14 to 21. If you want to turn there, you don't have to. But I will read it. And I want you to consider this. This was written, Paul wrote this during his house arrest while he was given favor to receive all those that come to him, teaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom of God, no one forbidding him. So think about that as he's writing these words. He's imprisoned. What is he doing? Doing exactly what God's called him to doing. He's still teaching, he's still preaching, he's still loving the people. And listen to what comes out of him to the Ephesians. He says... For this cause, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted 
and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all the ages, world without end. Amen. My God is worthy of it all. My God. I pray that yours is as well. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? To know the love of God. The unsearchable, the, the breadth, the height, the width. And here's what's interesting as I read this. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Well, how do you know something that passes knowledge? The natural human cannot know the love and fullness of God it transcends any relationship, anything earthly. That's how. It's given by the Spirit of God. Your inner man. That's what Paul spoke of. See, this is the challenge, and I hope the encouragement today. The challenge and the encouragement. To follow Christ, to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, rooted in, and grounded in the love of God, seeking to know the love of God, the height, the depth, the breadth. What a picture. Paul, what are you doing? You're in prison. I know. I know. Yep. And my Lord is with me. And it's he that's writing this. Isn't it amazing? I'll end with this. The church at Ephesus, which we spoke of, it was the New Year's message, because of our theme, remember and rebuild. That's the church that forgot. They forgot about the love of God. They were doing all this stuff. Got a lot of ministries going on. Children's ministry, youth ministry, senior ministry, uh, college and career ministry, coffee ministry. You name the ministry. They had it all going on. And Jesus said, hey, that's good stuff. But you forgot the most important thing. And because, listen, I'm going to tell you this. Jesus said, because if you don't repent... My candlestick, my presence will not be with any of those ministries. None of them. It'll be gone. That's the one thing you never want to lose, the love of God. His presence. You never want to lose the love of God. Think about the people who drew you. Think about the people that you know that are Christians. They're probably loving people. There was probably some love of God in them that help draw you. It's probably what you're attracted to. The love of God. All men, all men, will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And that love only comes from God, and it only comes when our preeminence is to Christ, when we die to ourselves, when our life is hidden in Christ, when we have a single eye. It's the only way it happens. I pray you're encouraged and challenged today, as I am, you got to understand something. Whenever you preach, you have to go through the message the whole week. So how do you think I feel going through this? But God is good, and he's worthy to be praised. And that Ephesian prayer that Paul had in chapter 3 is such a beautiful reminder of the love of God and what Paul was praying for the Ephesians. I pray for you. I pray for us. There's nothing like the love of God. That's how it happens. That's how change happens. That's how revolution happens. That's how revival happens. That's how rebuilding happens. The love of God. Amen? Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the opportunity to be challenged through your word, for the opportunity to be encouraged through your word. Father, I know as I stand here, so many times I'm anything but loving. So, Father, I need your help to grow in love. I need your help, Lord, to continue to be cultivated and pruned. Thank you for those who 
love me enough to cause me pain, to let me know when I'm being loveless. Thank you, Lord, for truth. Father, I pray for Spencerport Bible Church specifically, that they would know the love of God, that they would be rooted and grounded in love, that we would really be known by our love for one another. And Lord, help us if we are to have someone just walk in, a group of people or someone who just is radically, radically lost and different, to be prepared by being rooted and grounded in love, to embrace them in a way in which Christ would embrace the sinner. Jesus, you came to seek and to save that which was lost. Help us to remember that today. In Jesus' name, amen.